All right, today we're going to look at the third point of the doctrine uh, known as uh, Calvinism. Um, we've been looking at the tulip acrostic, which is a helpful, concise summary of what Calvinism is. We looked at the T, which stands for total depravity, uh, and last time we looked at the U, which stands for unconditional election. Um, this time we're going to look at the L, which stands for limited atonement. <laughs> um, this is one of the more controversial of the five points. I mean, all the, all the five points are controversial in their own way. Um, so what does limited atonement mean? Let me begin by explaining what it doesn't mean, because this is a, a point of confusion. Limited atonement um, should not be understood to be uh, referring to any kind of limitation on the love of God. Um, the Bible makes it very clear that the love of God is infinite. There is no limit to the love of God. Um, so, and there's also no limit to the power of, of Christ's atonement. Um, please don't think that people who believe in limited atonement believe that, that the, the atonement that Christ provided on the cross has um, only a limited ability to, to save people or to atone for people. There is no limit to the power of the sacrifice of Christ. The sacrifice of Christ being made by one who is both God and man is of infinite value. So let's not downgrade what's infinite to being something that's finite. So what does limited atonement mean? Well, a word that is uh, often used uh, today in lieu of limited atonement is a, another phrase, uh, definite atonement, or in some cases, particular redemption. And uh, the idea behind that is that um, Christ's atonement wasn't just a general, you know, blanket attempt to make salvation a possibility for the entire human race, but rather it was an actual uh, rescue operation that resulted in the specific salvation of specific people, um, those that are referred to in the Bible as the elect. So the idea, going back to what we talked about last time, is that God chooses to have mercy on some, and He chooses to pass over others. So according to this doctrine, the atonement was for those whom God had uh, chosen to have mercy on, and it wasn't for the world in a, in a general sense. Um, this makes a lot of sense, you know, in, in the scheme of, of the Calvinist doctrine. It fits rather, rather nicely in the overall system of doctrine. Um, I think if we affirm that Christ did, in fact, accomplish what he set out to accomplish, he, he provided an atonement, and he, he didn't you know, try to do something and only partly succeed. He, he succeeded in doing what he set out to do. I think it's important to emphasize that. I do think it's important, though, to avoid false dichotomies. And the way that this doctrine is often talked about is, in my opinion, a, a false dichotomy. I've heard uh, Reformed theologians pose the question, did, did Christ die to make salvation possible for the world as a whole, or did he die to actually secure the salvation of the elect? And I would say the answer is yes. He, he did both. I don't think we need to say that he did one or the other. He did both. He, he did, in fact, secure the salvation of the elect. I think that's biblical to say that. Um, but I also think it's biblical to say that the atonement was, in some sense, for the world as a whole. Um, you know, we can say that, that the atonement was not for the entire world in exactly the same sense, but it was for the world at least in some sense, because the Bible uses that language, that, that Christ tasted death for every man. And, if I be lifted up, I will draw all people to myself, and Christ is the Savior of all men, especially those who believe. Um, and so, the, the Christ is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Um, Calvinists sometimes, in my opinion, reinterpret these verses to only be saying that Christ died for all nations, not just for Israel. And I think in some of those passages, that is what's at stake. You know, that, that, that Christ died for the world, not just for Israel. Um, but I don't think that's always what's you know, in, 
do there. I think what sometimes is being communicated is that, that there is a sense in which Christ's death is, is for the world and that it's genuinely offered to whosoever will, whoever hears it. There's no one who hear, can hear the message of the gospel who hypothetically could say, well, this, isn't, this offer isn't for me because I'm not part of the elect. Uh, and if we think of the atonement along those lines, we're way off track. Um, I think it's biblical to say that the atonement was for the elect and, in some sense, for the world. He did die to, save, to secure the salvation of the elect. And he also died for the world. Um, in the book of Jude, the apostle talks about false teachers who even deny the Lord who bought them. And clearly what's in, in view here are teachers who are teaching apostasy. And yet even they are said to have been bought by the Lord. So we have to be consistent and not ignore any passage.